So tonight I'm very pleased to introduce to you Professor Terence Power. Professor Power has been awarded the Order of St. John, uh, Queen's New Year List, Officer Grade, as well as a Special Services Medal from both the European and Middle Eastern theaters for his two tours, the Canadian Defence Decoration 23 Years of Service, a BA from St. Mary's University, Law Degree from Dalhousie University, Masters of Public Administration from Dalhousie, an MBA from the University of New Zealand, and a Doctor of Business Administration from San Francisco University. Dr. Power is a Professor of Strategic and International Studies at Royal Roads University, and he previously held appointments with a number of leading national and international universities. Professor Power is a Wharton Fellow in the Wharton School of Business, University of Pennsylvania. And in 2008, Power joined the Oxford Roundtable, Harris Manchester College, Oxford University. He is also a published columnist and writer whose most recent texts include International Business, A Canadian Perspective, A Strategist Perspective, A Primer for Global Entrepreneurs, and Power's Student Case Study Analysis and Writer's Handbook. Power sits on a number of advisory boards and councils, including the Knowledge Management Institute of Canada, the Academic Board of the Institute of Strategic and International Studies, and the Comprehensive Security Studies Group. He frequently undertakes consulting assignments for the public and private sectors, and has been the keynote speaker at several national conferences. As a columnist, Power is a regular contributor to a number of business publications and is frequently identified as an authoritative media source. In 2010, Power was selected by the Globe and Mail Report on Business as the Professor to Stock. Dr. Power is an ex-infantry officer who enjoys the works of Tom Clancy, espouses the teaching of Sun Tzu, and is a devoted grandfather to his grandson, Matthew TJ, and granddaughter, Megan and McCluskey. Dr. Power resides in Langford, BC with his wife, Pauline. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you, Dr. Terry Power. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, good, Dave, you me on. Very kind words. Be uh, so delighted to see so many people here tonight. It, it's uh, quite exciting and uh, quite a nice warm feeling. I've had the opportunity, the university's been kind enough to send me across Canada and a chance to talk to alumni uh, in a number of centers. Uh, so important we have an alumni and what they can do for us. Uh, but I had a chance to go to Ottawa and to Toronto and uh, Calgary and Vancouver and of course here this evening talking to folks like you. Um, those that are just here tonight considering the university, I'm glad that you are considering the university. If you come to my world, it's business, and uh, I deliver the strategy courses at the uh, grad level. I'd be delighted to see you there. And the purpose of tonight's night is to give you some sense of what folks experience in, in one of our classes with the Faculty of Management and the importance of emerging issues and how they might impact our strategy and how we have to be aware, scanning, if you will, the horizon, the, what's coming through the, the, the fog uh, so we can mitigate the damage or exploit the opportunities that are about to be presented to us. Um, I, I saw on the watching the screen there, but I couldn't quite tell actually who. Can you put your hands up one more time? Who is an alumni from this organization? Recognized? Recognized one of us. Uh, let me just, good. And how many are from the business school? Right, just three folks. And you were in the Bob Become class, I think. Yeah, good, I'm glad you folks have made it. I recognize the gentleman down there with the receding hairline. Tell me about yourself, sir. Neville Gray. Of course, Neville. Ah, oh, you have changed. Let me share a story. I went to Calgary. I went to Calgary. See, I've been teaching here since the year 2000. And uh, about it's six... Years, Terry. Exactly. It's, well, that's my story. I went uh, to the Calgary group, and uh, about six or seven people came up the end. And the average age for MBA class is 39 to 41. And of course, you look much differently than Neville at 55. And so these old farts came up to me and losing their hair and out to here. And <laughs> anyway, it, it's, uh, it's quite, a, quite an interesting transition. So uh, Neville's good to see you. Good to see you. And let me just say this, not to shoot. I mean, Neville is an outstanding entrepreneur. He runs his own business. It, it's uh, you changed the name recently, but it's, uh, awesome it's one of the large firms in, 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 uh, in Victoria here. So he's done extremely well. Extremely, he's done extremely well in business, so uh, I, I like to see that from our grads, and our grads have. We've got a couple of assistant deputy ministers who've gone through our course, we've got captains in the Navy. Um, people have done extremely well in our, in our system, so thank you for coming. 
I'm going to spend about an hour and 15, 20 minutes with you tonight if I can. I've got 190 some odd slides. We're not going to go through them all. But uh, I understand we're going to send them out, right? To if, so if you signed up at the front, you'll get these with my speaking notes in the bottom. And if you're interested and have the time, you're welcome at your own pace to go through and flesh them out. And I'll give you my phone number, 250-472-3836. Um, Call me anytime. And that's a broad, a broad invitation. If you've got some questions on, on the slides or things you want to talk a little further about, I'd be delighted to hear from you. Um, so as I say tonight, I'm going to go through some of the emerging issues. We need to do that as strategists, what's about to happen, so we can craft strategies. You can't craft strategies unless you know what's going on in the water in the bathtub. And so I'm going to select some emerging issues that I kind of follow, and some are simply possibilities, some are probabilities, and one in particular is an absolute. And the absolute I'll spend some time on, and that's the Internet of Everything, is going to change every business, every business plan, every sector, every industry is going to be changed by the Internet of Everything. And that includes this education. And tonight I want to go through some selected industries and give you some suggestions of how it might change and what you need to do to transition, to reposition yourself for that, uh, this new industrial age that's sweeping over us. So let's get underway if we can. I do wear my glasses tonight, so I'm scanning up here as we go through it. Um, Clausewitz, I, watch, I enjoy Clausewitz, I enjoy Sun Tzu, and Clausewitz talks about politics and, and war. And I guess my first thing I want to share with you is the idea of possibility of World War III. I'm not going to get excited, but it's only a possibility. And I want to give you some evidence of that tonight. And at the end of my classes, there's no wrong right answers. You make your own decision. What's important to us as practitioners, as strategists, is that we collect all the data, the good and the bad, dump it on the table, sift it, and out of that comes sort of some sort of sense of the terrain you're happy to stand upon. There's no wrong right answers in the class. You make your own decision. But we need to challenge each other's hypothesis, test, and come to the bottom line conclusion. So let's go through those if we can. Um, some of these materials to give you attribution. There's this site here if you go through it and want to look at some of them. Uh, when I joined the Army in back in 1956, so right about my age, I was 15 at the time. Makes me 76 now. I'm still getting around. But as long as I can see lightning and hear thunder, Alan said I can stay. Right, Alan? Good. So I can still see lightning and that. In any event, so in those days, it was simply it was easy for domains of war. There was land, sea, and air. And it was easy to identify the folks that were uniform. The lands were, lines were cleanly drawn. But the world has shifted right now. There's six domains of war. And uh, the six domains are uh, space, economics, and cyber warfare. You've probably heard a lot about that. Recall recently they closed down a lot of sites in the uh, New England States area. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if the results tomorrow don't go the way I think they probably will go, and Trump loses. Um, you may see some action tomorrow on cyber warfare as we go through it. But I'm going to go through those six domains with you very quickly, give you some evidence to support my notion that uh, these are dangerous times. Sorry, back to these are some of the uh, conflict points, the tension points that I follow. Here they are, have a look there. Um, as I say, it's possible to, uh, with the 9-11 coming up in days the 8th and three days' time, or uh, as a result of the election tomorrow, we may see some of these actually come to the fore. Uh, certainly North Korea with Kim Jong-un is concerned. We have there 20, 28,500 American soldiers. Kim Jong-un is at wonderful little individual up there that's constantly beating his chest and threatening. You recall about a month ago when the G20 was meeting in Japan, he fired one of those missiles just because he could within the 200 mile limit of Japan, causing some heartburn to those folks and constantly threatening. In fact, he suggests that uh, um, if, the war, if the election turns out the wrong way, most recently yesterday, he said there'd be a war with North Korea again. So we watch North Korea, it's a concern to us. Uh, tensions in the East China Sea, I'm gonna talk a bit more about that later tonight. Uh, primarily in that, in the East China Sea, it's about oil, it's about Japan. Uh, we have uh, Taiwan, which is an interesting story. Uh, Taiwan, you recall, for those who would recall the idea of the Long March, when uh, Mao Zedong comes uh, down with Chiang Kai-shek in uh, 1949, Mao Zedong takes China, Chiang Kai-shek uh, and his uh, Kuomintang party take off and occupy Formosa, which uh, that becomes Taiwan. And of most recent years, there's been a move, economic interdependence growing between Taiwan and China. But recently what's happened, of course, is the, is the aspect that uh, um, the young people there have voted that they don't want that economic interdependence. They want to move farther away from China. And that's causing heartburn and tension because the Chinese have a lot of missiles lined up just across the, the pond and want to do something about it. And increasingly, we can see here, the Americans are equipping the Taiwanese with missiles to fire back and put some sort of a shield over Taiwan. So it's a concern. 74% uh, I see there, the China Taiwanese now identify themselves as Taiwanese, this nationalist movement that they want to be left alone in their own country. And that's a concern. 
But we'll talk more about nationalists versus globalists tonight. Um, the South China Sea is interesting. We have the eight dash area here that China says belongs to us, everything in the zone. And you need some background in there because China was at one point the Middle Kingdom. They were the center of the universe for 1,500, 2,000 years. The Europeans, everybody else came to China to see what they had in, in gunpowder and medicines and one thing or another. And then they went through the period of humiliation when the colonial powers in, in Europe came and dropped down in Macau and Hong Kong and places like that. And uh, for 150 years, China called it the period of humiliation. And uh, in 1978, when uh, um, the bamboo curtain comes down, um, from that point on, during the World Trade Organization, China is re-emerging again as a great power. And it's considering itself, it's stretching its, lame, its limbs and muscles and going in that area. And so it's simply trying to restore the natural balance, their perception of the world, that uh, they are the kingdom, they are the middle kingdom, and the rest revolves around them. And so their argument is simply, this was always ours. We lost it for 150 years, but get out, it is ours. And you can see the heartburn that causes to little nations, like the Philippines or Vietnam, that have a 12 mile limit, which is absolute theirs, but 200 miles out from any, any country, under the United Nations uh, Sea Conference, um, belongs to sort of an economic zone that the, the country controls. Canada has one of those up north, which is an issue to us. But you can see the overlap that takes place, and so when China plumps down and says to uh, the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, et cetera, get out, you can't fish here, you can't drill for oil here, you can't do these things, it causes some heartburn. They start with a little pod like this, just a little stone in the water and say, we're gonna build on that. And so over here, there's over 30 of these stones that they're building on. And when they finish the building, they look kind of like this. They pull up the sand, dredge, make it nice little things. So they effectively put aircraft carriers on land uh, all through this area. And why it's important is 40% of China's goods and services come through that channel on transportation. Intermodal transportation comes through that area. And uh, the other side, of course, is there's oil there as well. Uh, for them for them to drill up, and it's also the national security interest for them. So uh, this is what it ends up with. In fact, Canada has a little spot like this up north called uh, Hans Island. And we did some studies up there looking at it, and it's just not short of a pimple like this. Maybe it's about a, a kilometer long, but constantly we're fighting with the Danes. The Danes come over in the middle of the night, and they put a little cairn up and sing something, get back in the boats and go ashore. And then Canada goes up with its one soldier and two submarines, and we sort of take the cairn down and put our flag up. And again, as battles been going back and forth. So Canada's Arctic is under attack. There's a sovereignty issue up there, and we're underinsured, under and we'll talk a bit about that tonight. Um, power is what they've got there, but it's not as simple as this. Um, we have to understand that it's emerging today as a Sino-Russian, um, Sino, uh, uh, correction, Sino-Russian, uh, 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 Chinese, and, uh, and Islamic axis being formed, primarily with, with, with Iran. And uh, we'll talk more about this, the Shanghai Cooperative Group. And so we see emerging this new Axis power that's determined to block NATO and stand up to NATO. We have this situation in India and Pakistan, ongoing fights, shooting each other. Uh, as we speak, uh, there are troops moving to the borders on both sides fighting over Pakistan. By itself, it wouldn't seem important to us, but what it is important is, is the aspect that uh, these countries, particularly Pakistan, has nuclear weapons. And the question becomes of those nuclear weapons, of course, is uh, if uh, Mashad, who uh, runs uh, Pakistan, is uh, regime change takes place, who in fact will be running the country? And here we see things like the Taliban, uh, Talib, the Taliban and, and uh, ISIS and those groups uh, coming in here that uh, would completely uh, be very scary to have their hand on those sort of triggers. Um, Middle East big issue in the Middle East. The problem starts with the death of Muhammad back in around uh, 640 some odd. And at that point, uh, the two people, the two tribes are left, Sunni and Shia, and trying to decide from the blood of Muhammad who's gonna be the natural leaders to take over. And uh, that, that feud has gone on now for 1500 years as to who's gonna run it. And so we see the, the, the minority are the Shia, uh, the Shia, and they, they have about 15% uh, of the Muslims over there. Uh, led largely by Iran, uh, along with uh, Syria, um, along with uh, some other groups like the Houthi in, in, Viet, in, in uh, Yemen, uh, versus the, the kingpin is Saudi Arabia, which are the Sunnis, and the Sunnis have about 85% of the population, and they have a long linkages, all those other countries, ranging from Morocco, Egypt, except down, are all, they're, 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 they're following. 
And so we have this clash of civilizations between these two, these two groups going on, fighting for domination of that area, which is interesting. Recently in Yemen, you recall, there was an American boat there about a month ago, was opened upon, fired upon by the, uh, by the Houthi rebels, which are backed by Iran. Um, day later, the Americans went in and knocked out the missile control sites, and uh, the, the, the state is uh, still threatening. In fact, Yemen threatens Saudi constantly to uh, do something there. Um, Turkey's an interesting story. Turkey is the, the gateway to Europe, um, one of the large nations, the largest uh, NATO member in Europe with, with economic power, and it's been very troubled. It, it sits there and uh, large Muslim groups with inside of it, and they've asked repeatedly to become part of the European Union, at least on four occasions. They meet all the criteria under the Maastricht Treaty to, to gain qualifications to be a member of the European Union, but based on biases and bigotry, primarily from France, They've said, no, you can't belong. They make up an excuse and they keep chasing them away. The danger for us, the danger for the world is that if this country called Turkey decides not to look towards the European Union, but turns this way 180 degrees, it may well be the anchor and part of a new Muslim crescent that runs all the way over into Pakistan and, and edges onto China. And so we should be very concerned what happens to Turkey. And when the president was recently a regime change attempt, uh, Putin, who's very strategic in thinking, rushed right in and said, we're with you, we'll stay with you, and uh, he appreciated that. The Americans, Kerry, decided they'd just stand back in the bush for a little longer to see what the outcome was going to be. He didn't like that very much on regime change. So as a result, the... Uh, I'll come back to that in a second. As a result of that, um, the Americans start withdrawing their nuclear weapons from Turkey. This is a NATO partner. We use NATO to, we use their, their uh, land, Turkey, to, to land uh, with some regularity to go into the Middle East and do the bombing and the drone strikes and all that stuff. The Americans and the rest do so well. Uh, but they're starting to move the nuclear weapons out. And that's causing Turkey heartburn saying, don't you trust us? And we're moving them to Romania. And uh, there's a site of it there just uh, on approval went over with the day, 12th of May, they start moving them over. And so that's caused a concern. I think they said 20, but I think it's close to 50, because I think they have almost 100 tactical weapons, some of my other materials tell me they've got 100 nukes in the area. Um, back over here, I talk in terms of the Shanghai Cooperative Association, it's something we have to keep an eyeball on, that we have a situation of the Berlin, Berlin Wall coming down in 1989. Um, we have the Bamboo Curtain coming down in 1978. And uh, now what we see emerging is the Shanghai Cooperative Association <laughs> Uh, organization that has been around for years on a trade basis, but now it's become a military. Joint exercises are taking place, and it runs right straight from Russia through the northern stands over to, uh, over to uh, China. Uh, we have observer status from, from Iran, and also Pakistan and India both want to become part of it. This should be quite concerning to us as we see this repositioning taking place. Um, Muslims, European Union. We're probably aware from what you read, uh, coming in there, the concerns of uh, uh, Muslims coming in, migrating into the country, and the transformational shift it's making in the culture of, of these countries is certainly causing some concern, some heartburn for the residents who are there, uh, to the point that we see some on BRICS, for example, when the Brits tried to get out of, this, uh, got out of the, the European Union, one of the concerns was these open borders of who's coming in and, and who do we know who they are coming into the system. And we see these populations starting to jump and uh, with it comes um, the, the, the need for Shia law. They want Shia law as they come into it. Uh, we have certain areas in here that you'll find in some of these, uh, like France, uh, over here in Bulgaria, uh, some of the Scandinavian countries, you'll find that it's very difficult at night. There's certain enclaves that the, the police will not go into. Uh, certainly European women in these organizations um, have to dress far more conservatively if they want to walk the streets at night. It's, it's quite serious. And so, so there's some changes there, some cultural shifts, and it's something we need to, uh, need to look at and understand. Um, and I think it's large part is that uh, the accommodation of, of, uh, of how many we can possibly bring in and still keep the culture the same. And, the most, and I'm going a little further down here if I can. I say I poked the bear a little bit, but it, it, the concern would be, it seems to me, that if you change, if you have too many to change the culture, then you lose it. If folks come in and become French, whatever it happens to be, then there's less of a, less of a heartburn, less of a pushback on it. But uh, that doesn't happen. We see, see these enclaves starting, and it's quite troubling uh, for, uh, for folks. 
Um, we talked about subs and things. Uh, Russia, Ukraine is an issue. Um, we had the uh, Syria. Uh, Syria was uh, part of Russia back at the same time America became America, 1776. Uh, Syria was, uh, not, not Syria, rather the Crimea was uh, part of Russia. And it's part of the pipeline. It's where their Navy base on the Black Sea is based. Uh, their infrastructure is all going down there. And so when the Ukraine said, I think we're going to join NATO, Russians got quite threatened, saying, well, that's our port, that's our facility, those are our pipelines running north and south. What can we do about that? And so it was an issue. And, and again, troops are lining up on the border as we speak. And uh, it's quite possible that you see there's a schism, there's a schism down the center of, of the Ukraine, that on one side you have sort of the, the traditional Catholics and European sort of Ukraine folks, and on the other side you have a lot of Muslims uh, and the, uh, the idea of the Greek Orthodox religion. And so it's a natural line down here that I'd be concerned about a possible attack and some idea of this, this schism taking place in, in the Ukraine. And again, that is a concern to, to NATO and to Canada. Um, Syria is a big issue. There's so many issues there, but for tonight, I think I'll simply want to say it. Syria in large part is about oil, and oil is the idea here. You see the two, the, the blue going into Europe from Qatar, gas rather, and the other one is red uh, going in from, the, uh, from Iran going to Europe. And this is all being driven in large threat to Russia. Russia right now is dependent on its GMP, on its money, its tax money to make the world go round. It's based in large part on revenues coming in from, from oil. The price of oil falls as it has to about $46 a barrel. And before it was down to about $35 a barrel, it was quite a concern. And uh, so how they're going to, what they're trying to do here is just close off the Americans' initiative to supply gas to Germany, except energies to the Europe, that way, Europe, uh, the way Russian can continue to hold the, uh, hold the economy down for, uh, uh, for the European Union. You may recall that uh, Germany about three years ago was left cold in the wintertime because the uh, Russians turned off the tap on their, on their gas coming in. And so this is a fight very much about who controls the energy to Europe uh, as it goes through. Syria, US debt clock, can I click that for a second? This is the debt running up here, about $2.4 billion a day. $2.4 billion a day going into debt increasingly America as we do it. Can you just slide it up from the bottom for me, please? Scroll down, yeah. Down here, these are contingent liabilities. Add them up and you come almost to $2 trillion, $200 trillion. Not enough money in the world. But we can't be too smug. Canada's got the same problem. We got about $640 billion worth of debt. We pay about $40 billion a year in interest. And uh, currently our prime minister is saying we're going to run a $26 billion deficit this year, which means we go to who? the Chinese, to borrow it primarily, to uh, make the money so we can make this, this deficit go around. On that debt clock up here, that's $20 trillion, um, I did some calculations when it was far lower than that. Um, but based on today's interest rates, and an amount far lower than that, it came to roughly $285 billion. $285 billion in interest payments alone, primarily paid to the Chinese, which equivalents to actually what they put in their budget for the People's Liberation Army. If the rates go up simply to a historical levels of four to five percent, then uh, that goes to $845 billion, $845 billion in interest payments to the Chinese. That means they could actually increase their military, the People's Liberation Army, by fourfold, paid for by the American taxpayer. It's quite a concern. Thank you. I say, look at the Canada one at some point, because we couldn't be too smug. We're in the same sort of position. Most countries are. They simply go down the basement and, and print money. And it's not our money. It belongs to your kids and your grandkids. are going to have to pay it back. Economic, uh, so we have the vehicle currency. The, the Americans have had the ability to go down the basement and print. They are the vehicle currency. When you want to do something, go on a trip to Florida, you take the Canadian dollar and you trade it into American dollars. You want to buy something in China, you take it and buy the American dollar and then transfer it when you get there into Chinese currency and buy the stuff. That's over. The Chinese have now established outlets globally, capital markets and exchanges, that you can go in there and deal directly with the Chinese without going through the American dollar. Keep in mind a demand supply curve here, that if the demand reduction for the American dollar takes place, then that's of, of serious consequence. And so here what's happened just recently, uh, in the last couple of months, uh, China has been accepted by the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, to uh, put their currency in as one in the basket of five as a global currency. That's a big move, quite impressive for China. It is the second largest GMP in the world. 
it's the largest purchasing power parity in the world, bigger than America. Purchasing power parity, the idea that it can get more bang for its buck, which is interesting. So we have to be aware of this, that China's coming up, and increasingly there's this pressure on the demand supply curve for the American dollar to stay as the vehicle currency. There are other alternatives starting to come through, and countries like Russia, Venezuela, I mean, you can just go down the litany of, of nations that are anti-American who say, we don't want to use the American dollar anymore, let's find a substitute. And special drawing rights is one, bitcoins are another, gold is another, drachma is another, or basket of currencies, uh, all are being emerging as possibilities. Bitcoins I'll come to, but basically the idea of digital trust is something we need if we're going to use this new internet of everything. But certainly in the banking industry, we see things like negative interest rates in Europe are starting to happen. Uh, where the banks, you put $1,000 in and you get $995 back. That, that's troubling. Um, but before I get there, I want to talk about the economic domain for a few minutes. This is available to you online as you go through it. Note the names I've highlighted in, in, in the heavier brain bold. These are the folks who drafted that document up 18 months prior to uh, uh, Bush, I'm going to call him Bush Jr., but with respect, taking office in America. These are the folks that craft are saying, if we get elected, here's our master plan, our strategy for going forward. These are the goals. This is what they want to accomplish. It's all published in that book. And the link's at the top. Where did the link? There's the link. Click on that, and you go right there and find it. They move it around occasionally. But... And surprising, on page 51, you'll find this. Keep in mind, it was weapons of mass destruction and all the other reasons, but there it is, 18 months ahead of time, saying, we had some nice little event like a Pearl Harbor, and lo and behold, a Pearl Harbor event happens, then like dominoes, it's click, 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 click through the Middle East. How many here play Risk? Game of Risk. Remember the little game you play with little men? I love it. My kids hate me. <laughs> um, well, that's what it is. They went for control. Thought they'd run the board. Um, the election tonight, economic, another concern. Um, we're at a strategic inflection point. Uh, very interesting strategic inflection point. We've got Plato versus Aristotle. Plato being the sense of a collective, uh, one, one for all, the idea of NDP, socialism, uh, more safety nets, lots of taxes, versus the Aristotle sort of model, individual, John Stuart Mills, David Ricardo, Adam Smith, those sort of folks that says individual, get out of the way, I can take care of myself. That's being challenged tonight with the election. Which one of those will prevail? The idea of rich versus poor, this gap between the rich and the poor, and I'll talk more about that, is being challenged tonight. This idea of socialism versus democracy versus capitalism is being challenged tonight. The idea of nationalism, which Trump is talking about, um, versus globalist idea, one size fits all out of Brussels, that there'll be rules and regulations that will have universal application across all countries, versus nationalism, we don't want to give up any of our sovereignty, is being fought out tonight. And I think most would say that are nationalists that we believe in free trade. We want to trade. We understand uh, David Ricardo and Adam Smith and all these people, free trade works. What we don't want to do is go the next step towards political union and say we're going to give up some of our sovereignty and be ruled by Brussels, that sort of thing. But there's no wrong right answers. But be aware that tonight as we sit here, these issues are being decided in this election. And if they fall on the left-hand column, I don't think you'll ever get back. I'm not sure it was de Tocqueville, but somebody like that published along the line saying that as soon as the electors, as soon as the, the voters understand, they control the purse strings, they'll never stop voting more money and more supplies and more social safety nets themselves, and the next step is the thing balkanizes and goes in disarray. $20 trillion. Role of the fourth estate. That's in question tonight. Um, how many here actually believe what they see on CNN, Fox News, ABC, CBS? Anybody? Not one. Not one. You're 100% correct with the other, all the sites I've been. The trust, and remember this in business, you can take 35 years and build a brand, a reputation, and you can blow it in 15 seconds. Well, for me, these organizations have blown their, 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 their reputation, their brand. It's going to take a long time before I trust that announcer again to, to give me the true goods because they all have agendas. It's the demise of the fourth estate. And if it's the demise of the fourth estate, where do we turn for news today? I turn to the BBC, I turn to the Russian Times, I turn to Al Jazeera, and I look at these as well. But I need all the data information. I mean, these items alone, have you heard about these before in the news at night? 
no, we talk about the election and it's like the Enquirer magazine. So the idea of the fourth estate is going on, the trade is in, in, in flux tonight. If Hillary gets in, the TPP will be accepted. If Hillary doesn't get in, I suspect Trump will throw it. NAFTA is up for renegotiation, but that may not be a bad thing. We have 25% of the world's fresh water, and under the current agreement, that's in jeopardy. Americans and Europeans may soon own our water. So it's, it's worth revisiting. Syria, China, interesting. China's coming in there. I'll talk more about that, but they're closer ties. First time China's actually leaving its country and putting troops on the ground in Syria. Russians are putting troops in ports. Uh, Tertuk, I think it's called, their port, about $5 billion port on, on the Mediterranean they're working on. Uh, Russians have troops on the ground. And so there's a lot of people working in close proximity over there. It just takes one wrong move for something serious to happen. Um, Iceland's an interesting story. Um, Iceland doesn't sound too important, 350,000 people, but the reality is they sit on the Arctic Council. Very important place, along with Canada and America and uh, the Danes, um, they sit on the Arctic Council, Russia sit on the Arctic Council. And uh, they were able to loan some money, and uh, when America pulls out, they loaned some money, came in, uh, helped them with their mining, helped them get back up off the ground after they went bankrupt, with all the banks collapsed in 2008. And as a result, they've got some moral suasion at the table, because, Amer because Chinese have declared the three passages in Canada's north and the central and the Russian route, they're in the best in the national interest of China, because they can get their ships, large containers, through our north to Amsterdam in half the time, and the ships can be five times the size from can fit in the Panama Canal. They're very anxious to get into Canada's north and the Russian north and the Central Passageway. And so Arctic Council is interesting, but it's interesting to watch how the Chinese do that. It's not the same model that the Americans use in the Middle East, kick the door open and throw in a grenade, but they find a subtle way to get in. Book I wrote on the topic, um, which is interesting, but comes to me the idea of the, uh, what should Canada do? We sit on the second largest landmass in the world. Uh, we have 25% of the world's fresh water. We've got rare earths, we've got gold, silver, lumber, you name it, we have it. All those things that Porter talks about, Porter's uh, f uh, factors that uh, why countries are competitive, he talks in terms of basic factors, that's what we're talking about here, gold, silver, those sort of things, and advanced factor endowments, which are the skill sets you learn like in an MBA, and a country needs both those if it's gonna be competitive. But the problem for us is we've got all this wonderful second largest land mass, only 34 million people. My question to you is, being you're much younger, how are you gonna defend that when America or China or Europeans say, we're coming in. And if you see the problem, then the question may be, do we become a junior partner for somebody? Do we do a proper cost-benefit analysis, get rid of the biases, strip them out, and we consider China, we consider Russia, we consider uh, England with the Commonwealth connection, we consider America, or some other, but well, we should be looking at this now, because if we don't, what we're doing now is we're sleepwalking towards political union with America. We're at stage three right now with the five steps going up towards political union. The European Union's on step four going to step five, but at least they have the courtesy to announce to the, to the citizens, this is what we're doing. In Canada, it just happens quietly while you're sleeping at night and drip, 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 we're moving closer and closer and closer, and the question is, can we get back? I say, in my class, there's no wrong right answers. I poke the bear, I throw it out. I don't have all the answers, but we should be discussing this as citizens rather than just accept. Um, it's interesting, I talk about Go versus chess. All of you are probably familiar with chess. Chess is played, what we do is we go in there and we try to destroy the other side. We take their pawns, we take their rooks, we take their, their bishops, we try to capture the king, take their queen, we annihilate the board, and at the end of the day, we got six pieces left, they got three pieces left. We win, right? Go is a different game, played on a different level, far more intellectual. And it's very slowly, it takes longer, it's longer to play. And it's all about blocking, going to Russia. But Russia goes in and says, okay, I'm going to Iceland. We block there. We go into Africa, all the African nations. And we're not kicking doors in, but we're slowly going into Africa and block. We go into the Caribbean. Most of the Caribbean now is Chinese controlled. We go into certain Gold Coast in Australia and down uh, South America, slowly, click, 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 long range strategies. And it's a different, philosophy and how they play. So we see this playing out as we watch closely. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on this tonight. I'll just click through these, but uh, my sense is at the end of the day that the UK will stay part of NATO. Uh, I don't think it's as bad. Certainly they had everything thrown at them as, as Trump had everything thrown at them by all the establishment, by all the press, the fourth estate, and, 
Uh, even the Pope had a swing at him. Uh, so it seems to me that uh, they'll stay in NATO. The, the aspect of the students and the expats, yes, would be an issue. I think it's a chance for Canada to consider it's important that we decouple from America, not being anti-American, but about 10 years ago or so, we had about 82, 84% of what we did, manufactured, went to America. We were economically interdependent. So when America's national security interest wants something, it's pretty hard for us to say to those folks, we can't do that. So we kind of dragged along. So now we're down to about 70% of what we do goes to America. But we need to move faster and decouple, and that's to say, keep on trading with America. We just need to find other customers, and we need to do that. Uh, in order to uh, do this decoupling. Um, banks in Europe, 51 of them did a stress test recently. Um, two caught my eye with interest. The largest bank over there is the Deutsche Bank. It's almost part of the culture of Germany. It's not just a bank, it's part of the culture of Germany. It is Germany. And it's on the stage right now that it's, it can't meet. It's conditional liabilities. Uh, it, it's uh, net free capital is insufficient that if something happened of a, a major proportion, it couldn't pay all the bills it has to pay. It's quite serious. So at this point, do they issue new capital? New, who would buy a share in it? Not too many people want to buy equity in the, in the organization. Um, the idea of Angela Merkel with an election coming up next year and the mood of the electorate over there, not very supportive of Angela right now for to say, give me some more money for this bank bailout going on. And this is all about the money that went to Greece. The Italy Bank, the oldest bank in the, uh, since 1544, I think, um, is right up against the wall for going into receivership. And what we have to look for is just not just banks, those are like dominoes. If they start to fall, Europe starts to fall, and it comes another 2008 around on us. Things we should be looking at. Um, WikiReads, can I click that, please? We talk about cyber warfare next. This is real time. As we sit here tonight, as we sit here tonight, these are cyber attacks being taken back and forth. Microsoft up in this area here, all the heartland in, in America. And we do the same thing. Canada with CSIS in Ottawa has a similar facility. And we do hacking. We go look at what we can get and glean from the enemy. It's like probing the front lines. Uh, Russians do it. China's got the People's Liberation Army and many buildings doing it actively, probing the front lines, looking for weaknesses in infrastructure and banking systems and other. And it's happening. And the URLs, the URU, uh, the UPSs, et cetera, the IPs, who, who's coming, it's all here. You can trace them back on who's doing it. Did you realize how much of that is going on? And we don't know the results of that. They don't say, I got you. A few times, we, like a month or so ago, we saw things crash. But the infrastructure, for example, in America and Canada is old infrastructure. It wouldn't take much to, to knock it down and to freeze it up. So maybe they're finding those weaknesses and not doing anything about it until that point in time they, they feel they want to exercise it. Just military stuff. Thank you. All these are in the links that you're getting. You may recall this, that uh, Obama went to uh, Putin and said, a line of red sand on Syria, cross this line, and there'll be ramifications, repercussions. Well, Putin crossed the line, nothing happened. But a month ago, um, Obama says this to him, that if there's any uh, more cyber attacks on us, we'll consider that attack on NATO, which under Article 5 is attack on everybody, and uh, quite serious consequences. But yet we turn around and what, what's the, uh, President Obama's administration saying these days? Russians are hitting us with cyber warfare. And, and, the, more you, and the more you do that, uh, the more uh, credibility you lose with nations around the world. You can't make a threat, you can't issue an ultimatum, you can't make a, a thing if you're not going to, and I'm not looking for war to back it up, but I'm just saying we, got to, we need more strategic thinking uh, when we do these sort of things. Um, sitting over us, shining star, domain. Uh, don't know what's in it, but Kim Jong-un has got it up there. Twice a day it goes overhead, right up here, 100 miles above us. What's in it? It only takes five of these to put EMPs on North America, to put the lights out and drive us back 150 years, and everything's driven by computers. We don't know what's up there. This was a breakthrough that it just blew the Americans away. This is milliseconds. This is quantum communications, unhackable satellites. And Americans are just shell-shocked. They're so far behind in this field. And I think the Russians helped the Chinese on this one, so both of them have this, I, this, this uh, intellectual property. So those are, the, those are the reasons when I look at it and saying, the news we get on the fourth estate here locally doesn't tell us much about that. 
it's only possibilities, but I think it's incumbent on us as strategists, we should be looking at this, that if something was sunk in the Gulf of Hormuz tonight, 30% of the world's oil supply comes through that little tunnel channel just off Iran. If ships stop, what does that do to our, our efforts? It's a concern. Space junk. Okay, stand up for a second, stretch your legs. Okay, back in the oars. <laughs> what I want to push through right now, if I can, as far as I can go, is I want to talk something. Those are just possibilities and probabilities. This is absolute. This is happening now. It's already underway, and we need to understand it. And very few institutions are talking about this. Very few of your people you work with even know about this. They've heard the buzz phrase, Internet of Things, but they actually sat and thought critically about the implications of the Internet of Things. Let's go through some, if I can. The, uh, in the slides you get, it's kind of divided into four phases. We're not going to get through all four stages, but just some things I want to share with you very quickly. Um, what is the Internet of Things, Internet of Everything? We're all going to be connected. Animals will be connected. You and I will be connected. Toaster ovens will be connected. Fridges will be connected. Smart homes will be connected. Uh, centers on the highways, intermodal transportation. Everything will be connected, talking to each other back and forth. There will be no secrets. This is very Orwellian. Um, money, yeah, could uh, one one point nine trillion dollars to Canada's GMP, which is almost our GMP currently. It's quite a wonderful possibility, as we talk about it. Governments like the UK are putting money into this. I don't think Canada's got very much underway. It's a concern. Um, you can have a look at that. We're where we should be about twenty sixteen. We're moving up that, and we're meeting those those milestones. Uh, these are some of the generic things you talk about the Internet of Things. And I'll just let you have a look at those in your own time. I'm going to look at some industry sectors now and. If towards the end I haven't hit your industry and you want to talk about it briefly, we can chat very quickly about your industry and what's going to change in it. But let's talk about something very quickly. First, the food population, 9 billion people by 2050. Uh, we're talking about it. Um, yeah, 2050. Uh, 9 billion people. And that flies in the face of, most people say, most people talk in terms of, we're not going to have enough food. And if we don't have enough food, it's going to hurt off the population. There'll be not enough food to go around. Well, that's not the case, and I'm going to show you why. Um, these are drones. They run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, wind, rain, sleet, and they're done by, uh, well, let's say by drones, individuals. We don't need farmers. They sit back on their smartphone in the warm place of their house, and they control it. And the drones just don't harvest the wheat or the corn, whatever, but they check the pH level, the, the acidity in the soil. They check the, the water levels in the soil. Cows and animals like that are all tracked now and they go into that to self-milking machines that are all automated with robotics going into the system. It's going to reduce the number of farmers we need and the bigger farms we can have, because these things will work, and the cost of a, somebody to operate that tractor seven days a week, 24 hours a day, is removed off the cost of producing that loaf of bread. Cost should fall. Yeah. And we talked a bit about that. This is real. This is happening now in New York City. They took an old warehouse down. And this warehouse, by using, and look at the size of those towers, uh, with LED lights, solar power panels on the roof for electricity, which reduces the cost to zero. Um, all, all robotic automated things done, again with sensors telling you when it needs water, adding the water with robotics, and it's able to grow up to two million pounds of kale in the system. Again, this is in downtown New York. We don't need fertile ground. We could do this in the Arctic. LED lights, solar power panels. We could do it here in Victoria. We don't need to pull our stuff on the highways up from Mexico or tomatoes and things in the winter months at great cost and expense and takes them two or three days to ripen in transit. We can have one of these in Victoria and take it. Much fresher food and the cost comes down. The idea of plastic waste wrapping around uh, uh, food, yeah, we can do that. That's, but there's just an interesting thing. Um, Larry Page, Google co-founder, lots of money. He's putting flying cars together. And he says it's easier to put a flying car together up in the air than it is for a car on the ground, because there's less things to bang into. And he thinks these will be out in about three or four years. If you go online, you can actually see some that are flying now, uh, small little cars in the air. Uh, these are companies involved in uh, automated cars. Uh, include Ford, he put Ford in there. Um, but certainly Ford is planning on putting these in, uh, into New York 
as taxis replacing Ubers in four years' time. The idea here of uh, drone cars, mobile offices, pods, um, these things can be 3D printed, open sourced. The actual instructions, the model, the template, you download from the site, take your old plastics, it builds these things for you on some sort of a bed, again, solar powered, and uh, the costs come down. I only use my car 4% of the time. 96% of the time it sits in the alleyway rusting. That's not very efficient. Imagine for a moment if we had something like that, that particularly as I approached my age, I had the ability to call and say, bring the car around and drive me in and I get my glasses scotch and read my paper going from point A to point B. I kind of like that. Young people don't want that. Young people, the studies show, no, no, I still don't have my hand on the wheel. But the answer for that, as you'll see in a minute, is that the cost for insurance will be 60% lower driving one of these than it will be driving the old fashioned cars. So at some point it's gonna be so expensive, even though you like to drive your own car, the government's gonna push you out of it into these. And if we can co-op and collaborate and open source and use these sort of things for $18,000 a pop, um, we'll have less cars on the road. Carbon dioxide, the CO2 tax we're talking about, will disappear. Environmentalists were, where's my environmental lady? Yeah, environmentally. This is gonna be a, a boon to the carbon tax and all that sort of stuff. It's just coming, it's coming our way. Um, security, they can be hacked, yes they can. There's a good story here, you wanna look at it, 70 miles an hour, they show that a hacker can take over your car and drive you into a, a tree, okay? But also the police, CIA, and everybody else can watch what you're doing. Insurance companies can get some sense of how fast you drive. Do you jackrabbit up? Do you speed from point A to point B? And they'll base your insurance based on your driving habits that they will be able to download from your machine. This is interesting. This is actually done now. The Japanese have built them. 175,000, 175 driverless trucks, drone driven. Drone driven, no drivers any longer. 100,000 euro job, gone. Seven days a week, 24 hours a day. The industry in Canada is starting to adopt these things. Begs the question, where do the drivers go? Those 100,000 year jobs we're talking about. Um, these are some of the sub factors you could consider in doing a paper on it. Banking's interesting. How many here have a relationship with their bank? Really like their bank manager, know them inside out. Maybe sit down for a beer occasionally. Anybody? You're probably a banker. <laughs> Good. Well, you're the exception. I have to confess, in the old days, I had that relationship. I knew my banker. He said, hi, Terry. I said, Ralph, how are you doing? And we chatted with each other. Not any longer. I walk in. The faces keep changing like musical chairs. I want something. They say, well, fine. Fill out the form. Wait two days. They send it downtown, get a decision, send it back up. That relationship is gone from banks. We don't need it anymore. How many here do online banking? Enjoy? Yeah. Hey, and I'm an old fart. I do it. And so the reality is we're moving that way. And so banks are under threat right now because the internet of everything is changing it. How many apply for a mortgage, go in and talk to your mortgage officer at your bank, or do you go to a mortgage broker saying, I'm not really locked into that. Go anywhere you can. Get me the best deal you can. And all of a sudden they're bidding for your business and they come and say, here's six offers. Which one do you want? That's the way the world is going. The idea too of this, uh, uh, this FinTech, that this robotics, the IBM Watson type automated system, uh, actually you can talk to IBM Watson. How many here of Dragon Voice or some voice recognition system and used it? Anybody? Just me, two of us. And at the end of the day when you close down, um, it asks you, you want to sort of reboot it and change it and it can sort of adjust and tweak and get even better than it was when I started the day. And so it trains itself, it keeps getting better and better. To the point is, is that when you want advice up to $250,000 on investments, you're better seven days a week, 25 hours a day, talking to one of these machines that will make the right decision each and every time than an individual who may be hung over that morning or doesn't have a lot of time to spend for you. And so increasingly, banks are going to robots to deal with their clients. Uh, the idea of payment plans, uh, Apple Pay and these sort of things. There's under attack, it's all changing, the banking industry is changing. And so it has to reposition, has to find new ways to do things. Um, Bitcoins, talked about earlier, this idea of digital trust and coming. And so the Bitcoin, of course, the problem was, well, how do we know it's there? Well, governments are stepping in, so we have safety now, right? Government's involved. So government's coming in and saying, the Brits are saying, fine, call the Hayek is what they're gonna do, and uh, you can now start buying these 500 pound gold pieces from, from the state, and the state will hold them, give you credit and things for it. The Americans, not to be outdone, have done the same sort of thing, and they said, fine, in our idea, uh, here's an approved list of banks, institutions, 
go there, turn your money in, get the bank to give you your gold. The bank is certified and authorized to hold the gold in its repository, just these ones that are approved. And once you have that certificate saying the gold's on deposit, we'll now give you these bitcoins that you can do all sorts of transactions with. If you have bitcoins, I can buy stuff in China tonight without going through that demand supply thing for the American dollar. I can go directly. They can sell me bitcoins, I can do bitcoins, and move to a gold standard, which again decreases the required requirement on the American dollar. Education changes. This is critical for all of us, but in education, but for all of you folks, as robotics come on stream, this sort of work will go down and this sort of work will start to increase. And so what that means to you is that if you're in one of those repetitive jobs that 80% of what you do is the same sort of stuff, whether you're a lawyer or a banker or a, or a medical or driving a machine, you can be replaced and it's happening. And so we have to design our businesses around the idea of curiosity, creativity, empathy, that critical thinking portion, but the stuff once that's out, you don't need it any longer. I'll come back to that in a few minutes. Um, for, edge, for us, MOOCs uh, is a possibility for us to consider, massive online courses. Uh, I do an online course here in strategy for the MBAs. Um, I could do 10,000 students, not just 50. It's there with some adjustments, with some tweaks uh, for uh, tests, which would be radio buttons and things, using uh, virtual reality put on, come into my world, see the dust balls in the corner and have a conversation. Some old curmudgeon like me can ask you questions based on a case. And on that, that basis, uh, I'll ask you the question and uh, Taylor can press the button, and uh, if he gets it wrong, then he gets thrown back to the startup again, and the old curmudgeon talks to him again, this time with a different sort of scenario, but trying to get the same message across, press the button, and he can go right straight through the whole program. Construction industry could do the same thing, training his people for workers' compensation board. They all have to be certified for fall arrest and things of that nature, and here they can step into this virtual reality without leaving the, the classroom site, look down and walk in the trench, see the gas lines, Burnable fall arrest, et cetera, et cetera. Ask all the questions, check the radio boxes, at the end press print, and now the construction owner has a wonderful sheet of paper that certifies this individual has been trained in all the WCB stuff they have to be trained in, and therefore no more fines for the construction industry, but simply the individual gets fined because he breached or she breached the uh, instructions. Um, virtual reality, there's so much here I could talk about, but I think I'll push on. You can take my course any time of the year free from Wharton's strategy. You can sign up tomorrow, here's the link. Don't have to pay a penny for it. You can take the strategy course from Warden, free. Maybe what we need to do, and all the other courses, accounting, marketing, corporate finance, etc., are all there. And not just Warden, MIT, Harvard, etc., all provide these things. So the question becomes, maybe we become a browser, maybe we change our university. Maybe I don't need 50 people sitting in bricks and mortar. Maybe what I should simply do is you come and talk to me, tell me what you want to do in life, and I'll say, okay, take these seven courses from the best in the world, take Porter's course, at Harvard, take Jerry Wynn's course at Wharton. I can give you the best courses free. Cost of tuition comes down. What I want to see from me at the end is some certificate of completion. And then like law school, you can take your law degree anywhere, but if you want to practice in the province, you've got to take a comprehensive set of exams. You come in and you'll sit for say three or four months worth of crash course to make sure you have the essence of these topics. Um, then you sit and write the very comprehensive exam and if you pass, you get the piece of paper. You take two or three courses at Royal Roads to make sure we can put a stamp on you for roadies, to make sure we can get some alumni money from you, those sort of things, right? <laughs> but the point is we can change our portfolio, we can bring the cost of education down, we can use virtual reality in our classrooms. There's so much more we can do, we can have robotics. Japan right now have teachers that you could, if I was teaching accounting, if I teach statistics, basic sort of things don't change, two plus two equals four, you don't need me. You can go to this robotic seven days a week in your own time, ask the questions, have the robotic in a virtual reality room, holograph, three dimension, talk to you and say, Here's how we do two plus two equals four. If you understand it, click here and go on. If you don't, ask me again. Now I'll change the scenario of the story, but the essence of the question will still be the same. All this is now possible. Um, and so as I say, it's changing for education. Um, in, 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 in Royal Rose, when we first started in 1995, 2000, when I was here, we were the player. In, the, in this world, we were in what they call the blue ocean. It was all ours. There was very little folks in that. But over time, the blue ocean has turned red. Everybody likes our model, and so the big fellows with lots of resources like Western and others are coming into our world, and now we're fierce. We're fighting for 1.2 point, three percentage points of market share, where once upon, we could fill 200 MBAs in a, in a year by doing very little work, because we were in the blue ocean. 
we need to find that blue ocean again. And there are clues out there, little sparks of light out there we can do. I mean, I can often tell a joke about Patty being Irish, I guess I can say it, and Patty comes out of the pub, and he's on his hands and knees under the light standard, and he's down there feeling around, and the constable comes up and says, Patty, my son, what are you doing down there? He says, officer, I'm, I'm looking for my car keys. And he says, did you lose them there, Patty? He says, no, 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 he said, I lost them over there. Well, why aren't you over there? Because it's dark. And so the point is simply that. We look for synapses of light out in the darkness, and here's some synapses we could consider for doing that. The idea that Canada, the economic uh, council for Trudeau, just announced about two weeks ago that based on the internet of everything, they see the population in Canada, nine million middle-class Canadians, that's what we have, nine million middle-class Canadians earning income. He said, we'll drop to four and a half million. The other four and a half million will be fired, re rebooted, reset, re something, but there'll be no jobs for them. 4.5 million middle-class bright people because they're doing jobs that are gonna be replaced by robotics, taxi drivers, etc. where are they gonna go? That's an opportunity. And they also said we need 200,000 coders. Maybe railroads should get into the field of a bachelor's degree, not just a, a tech college school type degree, and there's plenty of those, but elevate it a little bit higher and have coder courses for a bachelor of commerce coding or something. And maybe we need a master's course that takes it to the next level, the idea of the internet technology in masters, because that's what the world is gonna need. That's where the jobs will be. Um, housing, I won't spend a lot of time in housing. I think most of you know this. This is 3D printed houses coming out. They're all hooked up, all linked. Your smart car hooks up out front. All solar power panels, it's in there. Uh, real estate's interesting, Sotheby's in Toronto, and there's now a firm that now sells this to all of the real estate companies. Virtual reality, if you want to buy a house from Sotheby's right now, you don't get driven around Toronto to six different homes. You go sit down in a nice, comfortable office, your cup of coffee, put on your little, little VR glasses, and you go around and you can look at the yard, walk around, look at the dust balls behind the corner of the couch. You can see the whole rooms, the whole buildings, have a look at it, and you see six homes in no time. Where do the real estate agents go? All they need is somebody at the front desk to help you write an offer. And the same with the insurance industry. Intermodal transportation. Interesting drones deliver blood in, uh, in, in Rwanda right now, 50 to 150 times a day, which is interesting. Uh, but the list goes on, transportation systems. This is interesting, a, a Mercedes truck, um, robotics driven down the highway. Imagine for a moment those trucks, they're gonna operate, and they're starting to operate now at a black warehouses. I'll talk about some in a minute. The lights are off, the heat's off, robotics are doing all the work in the dark. So up comes a robotic truck to the back door. Robotic takes it out, puts it on the robotic trucks. Robotic truck drives down to Vancouver to the Port Authority. Robotics un unload it, put it on a robo robotic uh, freighter uh, uh, container ship line, take it across the pond. All those jobs are lost. And if that is true, if that is true, if, if the idea we saw earlier that all these trucks are going to be robotic and moving towards that quickly, in Canada we have 250,000 truck drivers. 250,000 truck drivers. So that Suncor let go $100,000 of your jobs, where are all those people going to go? That's part of that 4.5 million that I'm talking about that are hitting us now. Um, solar power skin, pick up containers, move back and forth. We talk about Arctic's North, we've got CF-35s that want to buy for us that scream at 1,000, 1,200 miles an hour over the north. They couldn't even stop or put the brakes on to see a, some transgressor down on the ice. Muskeg up there is melting, can't build roads, they need roads up there. This is a solution we might consider, solar power free, drone driven, don't need people. It just goes back and forth, just like the SkyTrain does. Hop off, takes up stuff to the north. Um, somebody's passing through our place, sits down on the ice and it could easily have 35 soldiers on it with a 105 or something like that to make sure the message was carried, this is our land. We can't do that right now in the north. We have nothing to get up there. We don't have any icebreakers capable of getting up north. We have little, little uh, coastal things, but in the old ice, we can't break through it. The Saint Laurent, those things are just too, too old and too, too thin. Um, have a look at that for a minute. This, these are real factories. Where are the people? Amazon today in Toronto, 25% of the workforce is now robotics. Where are the people? McDonald's, true story. This year, I want to put 25,000 robots uh, in their McDonald's things. They're going to do all the work. You have one or two individuals who collect the money, stack the fries up to make sure that the, the supplies are there, but it's going to robotics. And if this is true, 
and each McDonald's has, let's say, 20 people, seven, three shifts or something like that, with seven or so at a time, times 25,000 stores, where do those people go? And if these people can get their competitive advantage down because cost of labor in restaurant industry is about one third of your total income goes towards, inc go towards labor costs, the price of McDonald's should drop by about a good third. What's that do to Harvey's and all the rest that aren't competing? They're going to have to. And where do all those people go? So robotics is a big thing, big thing. And in law, medicine, same thing. They're going to be applying. Lawyers are now downsizing, getting into robotics. They're going to be doing the bulwark. 80% of what, when we write a will, a contract, et cetera, 80% are at the same clauses. So you'll be interviewed by an IBM Watson. It will ask you the series of questions the lawyer has programmed in there. You'll respond to them, or you have a motor vehicle accident. Tell them what happened. What, give me the facts, what type of day it was. Keep pride, and you get all the facts entered in the computer. And then rather than the lawyer go off, as we did in the old days, to the, to the library to do some study and research and find similar cases and what the settlements were, what a minute, the machine will print it out for you. Here are 10 cases of 3,000 cases I just looked at. They have similar facts, similar situation. Here are the findings, and here's the range of settlement. The cost of law comes down. Same for medicines. Media publishing, one well, time, you all know about e-books. That was the old model we did. They gave me 18% to write these things. Um, today, with uh, going on, it's changing. I'll move quickly. Now we use e-books of this nature. Um, cost of publication, cost of books are coming down cheaper. Uh, more people are writing. Nanotechnology, pills, 3D parts. All this is here now. This is real stuff. It's happening as we speak. Great book. I'd like you to read that if you ever get around to it. You can go online, get it from Amazon secondhand. He's got a series of them out. He's a bit of a futurist. But he tells me that I will, before I pass along, providing I live a little bit longer, I'll be able to download whatever's in my head into a machine. And not only that, to the extent I have Facebook and other sites, that can all be big data grouped into that machine. My hologram can appear, or my kids and my grandkids and their grandkids can come to the machine and ask Terry, what about this? And whatever's in between my ears, I'll be able to share it with them. So I won't actually live. The hologram is just a hologram. But my point is the computer, an IBM Watson sort of thing, will be able to do that. He's a fantastic fellow, worth reading. In fact, they tried this on Stephen Hawkins. Tried to download. Didn't quite work yet, but they're working on it. Because again, he's got such a marvelous brain, they want to try to capture it. Military, great opportunities again for robotics and other things. This is camouflage using sensors. This is the new uh, Zumwalt. Uh, they're trying to build five of these things. Interesting thing is they've got laser weapons. They can fire a, a shell 63 nautical miles. That's from here to Nanaimo. Um, we have military robot planes. We don't need people anymore to fly our planes. Where do the fighter uh, Air Force folks go? These things go up now and fight each other based on robotics much faster, can take the G-force much faster than a, an individual can. They're coming out of the cysts right now. Dragonflies around smiling and snooping. These are real. We had the General Roberts uh, uh, Cohn in, in, uh, in the States uh, suggest two years ago that by 2030, 25% uh, of the infantry in America fighting in the Middle East, as they'll still be fighting there, will be using these things. The world is shifting. And I see policemen and everybody else doing these sort of things. Where do the people go? Um, missiles, a few thousand dollars, made it on ship, 3D printing. Um, one of the things I trained as in the early 60s was a uh, was a missile controller, got a missile controller. So I took things like the NTAC and SSB-11. Uh, one was a cost of $10,000 per unit, the other was 33000 3, and I fired a dozen, um, several thousands of dollars, several hundred thousands of dollars with the stuff they trained me with. The cost of war comes down a few thousand, they can build them right on the ship. Russians have this uh, in the program right now, talking about a drone submarine. Goes, lays off New York, flops down on the ground, and stays there quiet, silent, turned off, switched off for a year. Then emerges. Oil and gas industry, um, if you believe what I say about us moving towards drones and cars and automatic cars, then the demand supply curve for oil and gas is what? Less. And if the demand is less, the price of oil will be less. And the carbon in the community in the globe in 20, 30 years will be less and sooner as these cars start to hit the ground as we do it. Um, and the more we can harness the solar, and this little study here says we can uh, get so much energy possibility here, it, it's free, it lines on your head and my head every day if we could just harness it. And so the cost of solar power panels are dropping dramatically. Um, in Chile this year, 
they talk in terms of about three cents a kilowatt hour. Right now in BC, you're paying six to nine cents, depending on the tier. So it's cheaper to have solar, if you can get the chili model up here. In fact, the Site C Dam, our present premier is spending something like nine billion dollars out there flooding good farmland to put in a dam so we can sell electricity to California. It seems to me if we took nine billion dollars and took every home in BC, we could put solar power panels on the roof, give us a subsidy, and put all the electricity you want back into the system. And the storage, yeah, batteries. Batteries, we have that too. Um, here's some of the new breakthroughs in battery. Many will be aware of Musk and his, uh, his batteries that he's promoting. And now in Canada, they're starting to sell them for 3,500 bucks a pop for a house that can store the stuff that you take off. And what you don't use, you sell it back into the grid for BC Hydro rather than them charging you. Retail, I won't go through. Basically, retail's changing quickly. Smart mirrors, they're harnessing everything with the sensors and that that you can stay in your bear buff at home, stand in the mirror, uh, download whatever swimming suit, clothes, whatever you want, test drive them, get them exactly what you want, and they fit perfectly. All that is coming our way. Um, the idea of getting up into space, it's cheaper this way to move incrementally, sort of one foot an hour, and move what you want to take up there, rather than try to blast it off the surface. It's uh, much cheaper to get your goods and services up into space. Uh, Tesla, most, uh, Tesla, Tesla, Tesla Motors is uh, pushing on with its own little uh, space. Um, the other part of that was in, is Mars coming out. It is the idea of a laser propelled, and they say this is what it will do for you, that we can get in 72 hours, we can propel a, a pellet to the moon, or to the Mars. And if we did the same thing for, for a man, it would take about a month to get to there. This is not days and days and days and months and months and months. This is all just close. Well, I see folks getting tired, so I'm going to move very quick. Oh, this is a good book. If you get a chance to read this, this is good. He talks about zero-based margin content. The stuff I've told you tonight, what he's saying is happening is that there's going to be abundance. Um, if we use robotics to do this, if we use intermodal transportation that's all connected, the cost of goods are coming down. The cost of goods are coming down. And the collaborative commons, you folks are far more generous than my age. My age, you wanted to patent, license everything. You weren't allowed to use it. It was ours. But increasingly, the millennials are in the system saying, no, no, we open share. We have open source stuff. We share things. The idea is you want a, a template for, uh, for a pod car, it's online. Download it, and you can just have the plans and put it in your machine and make your own pod car. Go to YouTube. Want to cook a cake? It's up there free. Want to make a pizza? It's up there free. Want to have some chickens? It's up there free. Education, um, Wharton, free. And as the cost comes down in this collaborative commons, the cost of goods comes down close to zero. And that's what he's talking about. He talks in terms of a zero marginal cost society. But that's going to change the world for us because it means so many people are going to be unemployed. We'll still have the robotics doing all the work, but we're going to have a, the few privileges that work. And we have a whole bunch of other people down here that are going to be scrambling. And that's a challenge for Canadians on how we're going to do that. Um, capitalism, I talk about capitalism in there too, because I think capitalism will diminish. We have to find some other metric. If we we're going to have such high number of people unemployed, we measure worth of people now in their income, but if they don't have income, we don't need income any longer, there's an abundance. We need a new metric under this collaborative commons to make these people still have some sense of value in what they contribute. And the story in here somewhere, I, I spent some time thinking about that. This is important. Um, this is the dark side. This is just great that I can do my online banking, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a whole section in here we need to understand that data security, data privacy, data sovereignty, data censorship, like uh, Facebook the other day with Trump said, you can't be on our site anymore. Or Google says we're going to uh, adjust the trends to make sure the outcome is what we want. Um, that's a concern for us as citizens. And it's a dark side to this. And it's a looking glass. Once you step into this world, you can't get back. Once your stuff's up on Facebook, pretty hard to get back out of it. It's all being recorded and kept. Look at this, folks. Times Square, about 1900. Have a good hard look. Times Square, 15 years later. No cars. An infrastructure based on carriages, horses, livery stables. Energy is hay. Um, much slower pace, a lot of people walking. Different situation now, cars, infrastructure, gas stations, mechanics, uh, Model T, Fords, et cetera, et cetera. The whole world tipped in about 15 years. 
And I tell you what we're in now, this new industrial age is tipping even faster than 15 years. You have to be ready for it. Let me go to slide 70 for a second, I'll close. Dave, if you're out there, come see me. I guess maybe that's, I can't remember. I think that'll, that's it. Um, folks, I hope you enjoyed that. I don't want to keep that any later, the election's on, but also the other side of that is you're going to get copies of all this in your, uh, sent to you as, a, as an attachment shortly. Uh, have a look and say, if you're interested and want to talk about some of those in your industry, please give me a call. For those who remember Bonnie Castle, there must be a few from the MBA. Couple, this is probably. Bonnie Castle. Hello. Everyone, I'm Bonnie Castle, and I'm here with the current Good. count. It's 7.30 west on the Pacific Coast, Trump 167, Clinton 109. 167, 109. California's going to be a, a breaker. You know it. Okay. Thanks very much, Dave. Okay, folks, I'm finished. That's it. Thank you.